probably live now. Okay. So Ron, just so you know, uh, I'm on a satellite because I live off grid. So I have just a couple seconds delay in my voice. And um, anyway, just so you know that if it's uh, sounds weird sometimes, that's because I'm behind you guys. Okay. Oh, you're not that behind. Come on, Bear. Give yourself a little credit. Okay. Hey, guys. Uh, good to see you all in DLive. And uh, let's see. I'm getting. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and hit record and fire up, the, fire up the show. So let's do it. Excited to have Ron Gibson on today to, uh, for Land Patents Part 2. Let's do it. <clears throat> and boom, we're back for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winter, and I'm here as always with Dr. Bear Paul Lando coming to you live from the beautiful Smith River up in the great state of Jefferson where freedom still reigns supreme. We uh, are very excited to have a special guest actually in the state of Jefferson himself, Ron Gibson, who is uh, very much personifying all that we talk about in what he does and we are going to go into part two of our land patent special series. Extremely, extremely important, powerful information and um, something that we can all start taking action with today. Uh, it's been a fun summer. We've had some strange skies with some smoke from fires and a lot of overcast uh, weather of late. It's been very interesting weather. As we know, the grand solar minimum is here. And there's been stuff happening all over the country. That's just uh, a lot of anomalies. Very interesting times. I hope you guys are all enjoying the ride. And we're here to keep you grounded and um, deliver information that is practical and empowering and giving you the tools to help us create the new by developing parallel systems uh, and alternative systems and also using the classical systems that we've forgotten about, like we'll talk about today. Um, if you are new to the show, you can find out more about us at alphavedic.com. That's A-L-F-A-V-E-D-I-C.com. And you can also uh, join our online communities at on Telegram at t.me forward slash alphavedic or on Discord at alphavedic.com forward slash discord. You can also join our online co-op at patreon.com forward slash alphavedic. We are working hard to get off these platforms, uh, especially Patreon uh, with our own decentralized system. Uh, keep an eye out for that. Hopefully by the beginning of 2022, we will be everything will be on alphavedic.com hosted on Cordal and completely decentralized. So our domain name, our hosting, everything decentralized. So there's nobody, uh, nobody can take it down. The powers that shouldn't be will have no access to censor us. Very, very exciting times. Um, so today uh, we're gonna go back into land patents. Ron Gibson is unsurpassed as a land patent historian with over 50 years experience in land patents water rights, right of way, and property rights. As a constitutional scholar and expert witness, teacher, defender, enforcer, and assistance provider, it is no wonder that he is considered by many as a national treasure. On our last episode of AlphaCast, uh, myself and Dr. Lando uh, laid the foundation for this all-important topic. And uh, we are honored now to have Ron take us even deeper. He will not only add depth from firsthand experience, but address the common misconceptions fostered by naysayers and purposeful disinformation agents. Um, you definitely want to check out the first land patent uh, video uh, alpha cast we did. If you um, are just listening to this now, might be worth hitting pause and going to watch that because this is definitely going to be the next step. Um, however, you can just jump into this one as well. Uh, and then this might actually feed even nicely into the first one. So whatever you feel is going to make the most sense for you. And Dr. Bear Lando, how are you today? I'm doing great, uh, Michael. And uh, boy, we're on the same neighborhood here. Ron, you're just a stone's throw away in Medford, Oregon. We're here just um, 
across the California line. Sometimes I wish I was two inches uh, further across in your direction there. But uh, so honored to have you here. And, and thanks for being with us. And, you know, Ron, um, as Mike was saying, we did uh, part one of land patents. And uh, that was hopefully just to whet everybody's appetite for the real expert, which is you. And I would say if anybody had to uh, watch anything, just uh, jump right into part two here, because, uh, again, you're the you're the real deal that knows, uh, you know, all the ins and outs. You, you come from firsthand experience. You know, Ron, um, my grandparents moved here to this country to escape fascism and uh, within a single generation. They did very well. They realized the American dream. And I had all the opportunities. And my grandparents, because of that, uh, loved this country dearly and, uh, you know, respect uh, everything about it. And I grew up with those same values. And of course, uh, one of the main attractive things that uh, got them when they moved here is that you could actually own a piece of property, which was unheard of, you know, where they came from. And um, so here we are now where we've given up our ownership rights. And coincidentally, it just happens to be the first plank of communism of abolition of private property. So uh, I don't know what kind of government we have these days, if it's uh, communism or if it's our original republic. But this uh, issue of land patent today, uh, in my mind, is probably the most important process that anybody needs to learn about. So uh, we want to hear more from you today. And you just take it, you know, wherever you think we should start uh, with history or jump right into the process. Uh, you know, you know best. And then we will have uh, probably a good number of questions out there. So Ron, thanks again so much. And the uh, floor is all yours. Well, first of all, I want to thank you both for allowing me to come on your program. Uh, I really cherish the opportunity to share uh, the very important subject of land patent of land ownership and vested rights in the Constitution and all that's related to that. <clears throat> so I'm very indebted to you and people like you that allow me to do that. Uh, before we get started, if I may, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about me. And I'm not the focal point here today, but I hope it will kind of set the stage about what I'm doing and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, I grew up on a cattle ranch here in Southern Oregon. Uh, my mom and dad raised cattle and horses and they farmed and raised hay and whatever. And one of the beautiful things about that, my dad would plow the, the fields and I would help pack seed. He had a little old hand spreader that he spread with. We didn't have big fancy machine in those years. And, uh, you know, every day past the ranch at a county road went through it. Uh, there would be probably 15 or 20 log trucks that would go up and down Thompson Creek. And it was nothing but an old single lane uh, graveled road to start with. And every day, miners would go up and down the, uh, the road. And the point that I'm trying to make is that I learned the value of the land very early in my life. And I'm going to make a statement that a lot of people don't even understand what I said. But without land and land ownership, uh, you have no rights. And if you don't know your rights, you don't have your right, any rights. And that's been stated by the federal courts in numerous, numerous cases. So, but my background is engineering. My secondary studies was constitutional law. And I took to that like a duck to water. I love it. I love my country. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I spent 13 months in Vietnam uh, protecting the freedoms that we now enjoy. And many before me that, that, uh, there's an old saying, <clears throat> uh, all gave some and some gave it all. And the last nine months, and in, in actually a year, but uh, that actual travel, uh, I took Vietnam casualties home to their family. I was 
honored by being asked to be a body escort. So the, the price of freedom, folks, is not free. It was bought at the expense of many men's lives and service and whatever. And we have a, a, a moral and civic responsibility to protect that, that which has been paid for a great price. And so in through the course of my law studies and I got into mining law and I teach mining law, I teach constitutional law, I, I teach uh, four classes a month. So, and I do seminars all over the United States. And I'm not saying that to Pat Ron on the back. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of history. Uh, if I may mention, I've written several books. I'm on my third book. But one of the books that I wrote is What You Need to Know About Land Patents. And if you attend my seminar, they become part of it if you want to buy uh, a book, uh, they're available. The second book I wrote is called You're Not a Slave. And uh, boy, that's got a lot of meat and potatoes in it. And what You're Not a Slave is about is predicated upon the base of bringing your land patent forward. And there's a provision in law to do that. And I teach people how to do it. I People hire me to do that for them. There's a bunch of scenarios that, that uh, are available. But the point being is that for years I was asked, Ron, with your background and knowledge and land patents and water law and land law, whatever, you need to write a book. So um, I didn't know anything about writing a book. So finally the pressure kept getting more and more. And so I made up my mind I'd write a book. And I'm really glad that I did. Uh, it is tremendously informational. It is loaded with law. And one of the reasons I was asked, how come, Ron, you put so much law in your book? Because I did not want anyone saying, well, Ron, that's just your opinion. Because that's exactly what I did not want to come out. This is based upon historical fact. It's based upon court cases that have never been uh, overturned, uh, et cetera. And uh, so anyway, just to kind of give you a, a foundation of that, uh, this constitutional law and our land is such a critical issue. And I wanna make a statement before I, I, I get started. Folks, they're coming after your land and you better take note to that. And there are many ways that they're coming after your land. They're doing that, doing it out of excessive taxation for your for your, for your land. They're doing it out of, of environmental pressures. They're doing it out of, of uh, excessive, excessive regulation. Uh, that none of these things are, are warranted. And I don't know if you know, and this is part of the reason that I wrote this book, What You're Not a Slave. I prove that you're not obligated to pay property tax. And boy, I mean to tell you what, the tax departments across the nation hate me because I can prove it and did prove it uh, in the book. Mm -hmm. So the point, the, the, the point here is that you have to reposition the jurisdiction of your land. Now, I wanna say something here and I'm gonna give you a little bit of history about what happened. Most people refer to land nowadays by the term of real estate. Real estate and, and land are not one and the same in their lawful definitions. And what happened was, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do the Reader Digest version of this land patent class because we don't have all day and, and hey, whatever, but- Hey, Ron, can I interrupt, interrupt you one second? Yes. Just, just so I can drop the link in, because people are already asking, and it's hard to find it on, on the internet. Where can people buy this these books? They, they buy the book from me. Uh, I'll give you my phone number and email. Uh, I give it now if you choose. Uh, my email address is D-R-I-T-E-C-R-G at hotmail.com 
called Dry Tech, Dry with an I, Tech with no H, RG at hotmail.com. And, awesome. my, and my phone number is 541 621 5548. I love it. That's what we call old school right there. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Ron. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so if you're interested in a book, contact me by one uh, of those two methods, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'll be glad to get you a book out. So, but the, the point that I was trying to make <clears throat> is that they're coming after your land. And I could tell you horror stories all day long about what's happening. But most people being creatures of habit uh, will not do anything until it's too late. And once it's too late, it is too late. So I just want to give you a heads up. I have been for the sake of terminology, standing on the rooftop for at least the last 30 years and screaming to the top of my lungs, get your land, your property back into a land patent. And everybody looked at me like I had three heads. But now things are beginning, uh, well, let me rephrase it. It appears that there's an awakening, that people are realizing that they're under threat with their property and your rights. Now, I wanna say something here that I want you to pay very close attention to. Without property, you have no rights. That's why the issuance of a land patent, you acquire with that land patent or to bring your land patent forward, what we define in law as a bundle of rights. And those rights are called vested rights, which means that they are in law. That law being the constitution and our bill of rights that we so cherish uh, because vested rights cannot be taken away. They cannot be diminished. They cannot be circumvented or anything of the such. But the problem here, folks, is most of you, you don't know what your rights are. And that's like the federal courts have said. If you don't know your rights, you don't have any rights because you don't know how to defend it. You don't know when to speak up or what. And you don't have to know it all, folks. Boy, don't ever think that, well, you don't know enough. Uh, because I don't know enough. I've been in this stuff for 49 years. So I'm just saying, stand up and do something. I want to read to you a little paper that I use as a reminder. And this says, when a patriot undertakes a long and difficult task, he labors in pain and without and with great hardship. But once he begins to succeed, all of the standbyers will want to join in because it costs them nothing. And boy, I'll tell you what, I have seen so much of that in my life in my own situation. People tell me I'm crazy for what trying to to uh, you know, teach people about these land patents and one thing or another. But uh, I, I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is you have to make the decision about what you wanna do about the safety of your property and, the, and your future. Because if you don't do something about protecting their land, they're coming after it. And I, I can assure you, they're, they're, they're coming after it. So the decision is yours. I have an old saying that I use at my land patent seminars all the time, and I'll share it here. In my life experience, I have realized there are three types of people. Those who make things happen. The second one is those who watch things happen. And the third one is people who look around one day and wonder what happened. And, uh, you know, we kind of chuckle at that. But the real question is, which one are you? And I have people all the time tell me, Ron, what can I do? I'm only one. And my instant response to that, but you are one. And you and I make two. 
and the next person who's one, we make three. You see where I'm going with that? And if we band together, all power is inherent in the people. That goes clear back to Genesis in the Bible, where God gave man dominion over the entire earth. And we have, instead of being kings of our land, we have become sheep. We just do what they tell us, jump how high and what direction, whatever. Uh, we better stop doing that real quick. I don't know if any of you are aware, but the the Constitution, when it went, the uh, first signers of it was the Commonwealth of Delaware, that the words, we the people, were not a part of that document. And I have researched and researched and researched, and I cannot find evidence to validate whether the people from the Commonwealth of Delaware knew what they were doing, they did it by divine intervention, or just did it. I, I, I don't know. But nevertheless, the point is that they did do it. And what that did, folks, and listen carefully, made every American king of your land. Did, did you get that? It made you and I kings of our land. And that's the reason that sovereigns are not subject to law. We are the creators of law. Government doesn't make laws. We, the people, do in and through, supposedly, our, our representatives. And boy, I could get into a whole discussion on that issue. But the point being is that we have the power, and we have let it slip away through indoctrination about what we, the people, needs to do to keep things on the straight and narrow. And look at our so-called government today that is not a government, and look at the problems. Uh, what a mess. What a mess. But anyway, let's get on with the program here. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called a patent. It's in most instances, it's a single page. Actually, the, the technical name is they're called letter patents. They look like a letter, okay? That's why they call them that. But these are issued by the United States. General Land Office, and later through the Bureau of Land Management, which took over the position and the authority of the General Land Office. But which that is, another thing that I want to clarify, when those land patents are issued to the grantee, the government is called the grantor, and the recipient of that, the private sector, is called the grantee, okay? Once that patent passes from the grantee to the second party down the line, you either receive it in the form of an heir, which you inherited, or as an assign or an assignee. Okay. And there's provision in this document right here called the land patent. It describes who issues it, the United States government. It describes the name of the person who who received it, it describes the date and the patent number, and it gives the, the legal description of the land that they conveyed. Down toward the bottom, it says something very interesting. And I'm just picking a part of this, all right? Or sharing a part of it with you. It is hereby granted to the undersigned to their heirs and assigns forever. Now notice that said forever. And I'm looking at my watch right now and forever it not yet, okay? Which means that this bringing your land patent forward by authorization of this letters patent, which comes out of the constitution, that comes under article four, section three, clause two of the constitution. Now, this also is protected by numerous constitutional protective covenants. Number one is the treaty law, Article 6, Clause 2 of the United States Constitution. It's protected by Article 5 that you can't take uh, property away without just compensation. And Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, and I love that. And for those of you who have a, a constitutional book handy or go to your internet or whatever, but you get down in it just a little ways, and it says the following, the states are forbidden from legislating a bill of attainder, 
number one. Number two is an ex post facto law. And number three, they cannot legislate, <clears throat> excuse me, anything that impairs the obligation of contract. Now, boy, let me tell you what, those three items are ultra, ultra critical. Let me give you an example. I'm gonna to read to you, let me find it here. It's called the Bill of the Tender. See if I can find it, I got a call. Here we go. I knew I had it someplace. What's the old saying? Nothing is lost, everything is somewhere. <laughs> But let me read to you the definition of a bill of attainder, because pay, pay close attention. A bill of attainder is defined as a legislative act which inflicts punishment without judicial trial, without that of a judge. They assume the position of a judge and assume the judicial magistrate and pronounces the guilt on the party without any form of safeguards of a trial and then fixes the punishment. And I got all kinds of court cases on that. And the point being a tax foreclosure sale is a bill of attainder. You get a notice of sale on a foreclosure is a bill of attainder. If you get a traffic ticket on the highway because you're fined relative to that document, what the fine is, is, is a bill of attainder. And I could go on and on and on. But the point being is that all of those are unlawful. They're legal. Legal and lawful are not one and the same. Let me tell you what legal is. Legal was a redefining of lawful terms for the purpose of circumventing the law of God. And it's called the... Uh, the <clears throat> um, well, my mind went blank here. The common law, excuse me. And common law is what we started out with in our country. And now they have redefined legal terms. And that's unlawful to do that in itself. If you want to go to true definitions, get you a 19, uh, excuse me, an 1828 uh, Webster's Dictionary. That's the basis of which the constitutional verbiage was used uh, out of that dictionary. I want to read you another document. Oh, let me, let me go on here. A bill of attainder means that you had a right yesterday and now today the legislature doesn't act and claims that now you don't have that right. You can only have permission, okay? And we find that in land rights. We find it in a right of travel. We find it in all segments of our life. They have redefined legal terms, lawful terms to legal terms. And the third one is called that no state can legislate or impair the obligation of contract. Now, I want you to listen carefully. What that means, that there can be no action by court or legislative uh, action that can affect your land relative to population of land. You know, you can't lien a land patent. If you think that I'm not, that I'm kidding, you go to your bank and say, hey, I wanna, I wanna apply for a loan, but this land is, has got a land patent on. That banker will shake his head and say, no, I can't loan. Because they can't put a lien on it. It has no standing in law. Now I deal in law, folks. I have to use statutes and codes, but our so-called government now is not a government at all. It's a corporation portraying that it is a government and you and I are not subject to that. There's a very famous case called City of Dallas versus Mitchell. And in that case on page three, the, the court stated something so true and accurate. And it said, our rights don't come from government. Our rights come from our creator. And we are not subject to government rules and regulations unless we volunteer to be subject to those rules and regulations. So please keep that in mind. So 
those are three of the elements that are very important about the, the protective covenant. And there are many more. This land patent that I showed you here is in stone, if I can put it in that context. And it had been tested for over 180 years plus. It is never lost at the Supreme Court level. Now, let me share something with wow. you. Never lost. Wow. And the reason being that when the patent is issued, <clears throat> excuse me, by the United States government to the grantee, that's the creation of the forever contract. The United States government is then obligated to protect that patent in any kind of attack uh, uh, in impairing the obligation of contract. We had a case here about seven, eight years ago that I was <clears throat> pardon, <clears throat> excuse me, involved in, and we named the United States government. And the Justice Department wrote a letter back and said, how come you're involved with us in the lawsuit? And we told this high ranking uh, uh, justice uh, uh, att att attorney that in fact, they're obligated to protect that patent. He didn't know what I was talking about. And I tell you, I could tell you stories about that all day long. But he said, we're not a party to that action that you're undertaking. We said, bull crap, you are a party because you're the issuing agency that issued the patent and signed by the president. What do you mean you're not a party? You have to protect that patent. And so they've not done a very good job of that lately. So anyway, uh, I, I, want to, I want to move on to another subject before we get into further details of this. Congress has, has legislated numerous legislations that are totally unconstitutional. For instance, Act of 1871 that made uh, Washington, D.C. A, a, a district, a federal district. Uh, the Federal Reserve Act, they had no authority to do that. Uh, and also FLIPMA, Federal Land Policy Management Act, that they did. Uh, and the other one, uh, the biggie, was the Administrative Procedures Act. Now, let me describe to you the best that I can. And I'm going to use my hands here, so please try to follow me. The land patent issue issued by the government was at this level. And when the Administrative Procedures Act came into play, then it went down like this, and then went across. So it's like a step, okay? If I can kind of a crude analogy, but best I know to illustrate it. What happened as a result of that uh, June 11th, 1946 enactment by Congress that they had no authority to do constitutionally created the ability for the, for the corporation to claim, not that they have lawful authority because they did not, but the claim that they are now a government. What's interesting about that, they then redefined terms like I mentioned to you earlier and redefined land under the patent designation to real estate. So if I can use the analogy, they came and put a blanket over from June 11th on over the top of it and they claim now. Now you're asking, well, why did they do that? Very simple. They wanted to get control of you and your land and your money. So they redefine. And there's a, there's a maximum in law, the universal. You can only claim jurisdiction over that which you create. So they had to create a new set of definitions for them to claim jurisdiction over it. Oh, another one is your straw man name. Look on your bank account, your driver's license, your social security, whatever uh, document that you have, and it's all in capital letters. They claim that that is now the new you, that they claim that that's who you are, but you're not claiming that's who you are because you, your real name is your Christian name, upper and lower case. So to get jurisdiction or to claim jurisdiction, that's how they did it. 
Well, all of that, folks, is unlawful. And we have been so indoctrinated that, oh my gosh, the government's right, I must obey it. And they're killing the life out of their constitutional republic. And we better wake up and take a stand because if we don't, we're gonna lose it. And once you lose it, you never get it back, okay? All right, let's move on. But this land patent document is one wonderful piece of business, I'll tell you. And it was all by the power of our, our forefathers who did a miraculous job. I'm looking for a document here, folks. So, um, Ron, so would you say that um, no matter what, even though they, the, the legalese that the corporations pulled off, we still have um, our own jurisdiction as uh, living men and women in the foundation of common law, but even above and beyond that with the foundation of natural law or ecclesiastic law. Have you delved into that and seen cases where that superseded the, the legal structure of the corporation? Yes. In fact, if you challenge it on that basis, uh, the, the legal uh, enactments uh, will be defeated because there's a case, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, that said you cannot supersede common law with the Legislative Administrative Act enactment. So uh, yeah, I, I, I've seen a lot of it. I do a tremendous amount of research, have all my life, and I have documents. Uh, <laughs> tell you a little short story, if I may, and I don't mean to chew up some time here, but when I was decided to finally to write my patent book. I mean, I've got storage units full of, of, of documents and what I got so much, I don't even know anymore what I have. But anyway, I ended up with a pile that about almost 24 inches tall was sitting on my desk. And my son and I shared the same office at the time. And he walked by and he looked at that and he shook his head and he started laughing. And I said, what are you laughing at? He said, Dad, with all of the information that you're putting in that book, he said, most people are going to be an informational overload in about two and a half minutes. And we both laughed. But uh, there's a lot in it, folks. And I don't say that to be boasting or whatever, but just as a fact it is. Now, I want to address for a moment to digress, I guess, uh, of where this forever term came from that our forefathers put in this land patent, okay? And it comes from your Bible. Let me read this to you because boy, this spells it out. And I wrote a document called Forever. Genesis 13, 15, for all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. Exodus 32, 13, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all of the land of which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. Joshua 14, 9. So Moses swore on that day saying, surely that the land of which your foot has trodden will be an, inherited, uh, an inheritance to you and to your children forever because you have followed the Lord your God fully. First Chronicles 28, 8. So now in the sight of all of Israel and the assembly of the Lord and the hearing of our God, observe and seek all of his commandments of the Lord your God so that you may possess the good land and bequeath it to your sons after you forever. Second Chronicles 27, did you not, O God, drive out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? Ezra 9, 12, so do not give your daughters to their sons nor take their daughters for your sons and never seek their peace or their prosperity, that you may be strong and eat of the good things of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your sons forever. Psalm 37, 29, the righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Isaiah 60, 21, 
when all you people will be righteous, they will possess the land forever and the branch of my planting and the work of my hand that I may be glorified. Beautiful. Jeremiah 7, 7. Then I will let you dwell in this place and in the land that I gave your fathers forever and ever. Jeremiah 25, 5, saying, turn now everyone from the evil way and from the evil of your deeds and dwell in this land of the Lord God has given you and your forefathers forever and ever. Ezekiel 37, 25, they will live in the land and I will give Jacob, Jacob my servant in which your fathers live and they will live in it and their sons and their sons and their sons forever. And my, day, and my servant David will be their prince forever. The reason that I want to read that to you folks, and boy, make no mistake about this. Land ownership is a God-given right. All right? That's why they, the, the, the so-called government, or any government from that matter, has no authority to infringe upon your land. Now, I want to read you something out of my book on page five. Okay. This I got out of research from the report done by the General Land Office to the Congress and Senate back in uh, 1870. And here is the quote, direct quote out of that report. The individual title derived from the government involves the entire transfer of the ownership of the soil and water. It is purely allodial. Remember that word, folks, allodial, A-L-L-O-D-I-A-L with all the incidents pertaining to the title as substantial as in the infancy of a tectonic civilization, following in the wake of this fundamental reform, reform in our state land laws are several others which constitute appropriate corollary. The next paragraph, listen carefully. The statute of use has never adopted in the public land states and hence the complex distinction between use and trust has never embarrassed our jurisprudence. Now you may be saying, Ron, what, what do you mean? That means that you have full right to use your pro property as you see fit without the right of anybody. I don't care if it's a code enforcement. I don't care if it's the president of the United States. I don't care if it's Congress or Senate, whatever. When you receive that letters patent, folks, you have an allodial title. If you're an assignee and bring your land patent forward, you have every bit of the same protection and the protective covenants that the original grantee had. They're saying it's an embarrassment to bring any kind of a challenge to the use of your land into any court. That's what it's saying. Boy, you talk about a powerful statement. It was never adopted in common law. But of course, now that we have administrative law, and it's really not law at all, statutes and codes are not law. They are corporate rules and regulations. And I get a lot of heat from government personnel. Well, how can you say that? I say, real easy. I've done research. Don't believe me, go look it up. I'm here to educate you but you're infringing upon my rights and my property and I will not stand for it. I want to share a little story with you. I like stories. I teach mining law, I have for years and years and years. And we were having trouble with the sheriff's department and the BLM of coming and fining and arresting miners. Uh, the mining law is an act of Congress, just like the patent law was. And as a result of that, it's under HR 365, if you're interested. 
But in that enactment, we have a right to go upon the public lands and search for minerals, whatever. So anyway, our guys are getting harassed by the sheriff's department and whatever. And so I went and talked to one of our county commissioners, her name was Sandy Casanelli. And I told her what was happening. I said, could you get a meeting set up with the other two commissioners so we can discuss this? She said, yes. So anyway, the day of the meeting it was in the afternoon. She came out to meet us. There were about 17 or 18 of us there ready to go in. As we started up the steps of the courthouse, she turned around and she put her hand right in the upper part of my chest and just held me there. And she said, I need to tell you guys something. And I said, what's that? And still holding her hand on my chest with her right hand, she turned around and she pointed from one end of that courthouse to the other. And she said, everyone in that courthouse is scared to death of you minors. And I said, what? She said, they're scared to death. I said, why? She said, because they all know now that you guys know the law. And boy, oh boy, you, we found that reception to be totally different because we do know the law. And that's what I'm asking you. To, you don't have to know it all, but folks do a little return that television off for a while. Go to the internet or the law library or whatever and learn what your rights are. Because when you challenge your jurisdiction and you know what you're talking about, they have no defense. Okay? So, all right, let's move on. I have here in my hand a copy of a case. It's a 1984 case, and it's called Summa Corporation versus State of California Coastal Commission. And in that case, give you a little quick history, the state of California decided that they were going to take away from Suba Corporation that owned patented land from West Los Angeles to the Pacific Ocean Beach. And uh, they wanted to make it for public beach access. And so it got into a court battle and the Superior Court of California Rule against Suma Corporation. Suma Corporation had a patent, okay? They had acquired it after it had been brought forward by an individual. So then they went to the State Appeals Court in California. State Appeals Court ruled against them. They went to the, the uh, uh, California Supreme Court. They ruled against them. So they petitioned the federal court. The federal court ruled against them. Then they went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco, and they ruled against them. So they petitioned the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court said, yes, we'll take the case. So in the hearings in that case, the United States Supreme Court blistered, I mean, literally blistered in the ruling, the state of California. Number one, they told them that, that that patent was protected by treaty law. And they go into quite detail of the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty, which included California, Arizona, and other, other states before the United States acquired it. They also address the issue of privity. Privity is a Latin term, which means to have lawful standing inter intervene in a case. In essence, that's what it is. The other thing they talked about there was the fact that Suma's land was patented and that's an allodial title. And the Supreme Court said, I'm gonna cut this short, that unless the state of California was named on that original patent, they had no authority nor jurisdiction of which to make any claim or claim any jurisdiction over that land. Now, I don't know about you folks, but that's monumental. I'm telling you, that's That's monumental. huge. You bet it is huge. So this little slip of paper has been tested and tested and tested and tested for almost two centuries. 
Yeah, and we had we had questions uh, last go around where people were asking about eminent domain, and you just answered that question. The eminent domain is cannot be applied to a patented land without your knowledge and consent. Real estate, they can come and take it. Sometimes they pay you, most times they don't. If they do pay you, they don't pay you market value or the damage that it creates to the rest of your property. So here we hey, are. Hey, Ron? Yes. Could I make a quick comment? Sorry to interrupt your flow. Uh, we had one uh, comment from the peanut gallery where a gentleman was having a hard time that we're actually discussing the Bible and asked if uh, I've ever read it myself. And uh, I just wanted to show the gentleman that not only do I read it, <clears throat> but I've tabbed all the pertinent sections uh, that are relevant to the legal system and that it's in fact the blueprint of the legal system. So, um, so anyway, I just wanted to make that point for our audience. Boy, that's, that's so profound, and thank you for that. Because our common law comes from the Bible. Our Bill of Rights comes from the Bible. Our Constitution comes from principles of the Bible. Our American flag comes by virtue of from Scripture. My, oh my. I'll tell you what. I love our American flag. I fought for it and was willing to die for if it needed to be. And boy, you wanna get on the wrong side of me, this burn or step all over a flag because this whole Yaki Indian gonna come unglued. So, okay, but thank you for that. Very, very <laughs> profound, I appreciate that. I want to read you now, uh, well, I think I covered it, but vested rights, okay? Vested rights mean that it's in law. And what law are you talking about? It's called the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Now, I want to go back to the patent for a moment. And I want you to follow me because this gets confusing to people. And I'll try not to make it confusing. The letters patent, as I'm holding here, the piece of paper that is transferred and issued from the United States government to the grantee is not your title, although we call it the title. What it really is, is evidence of your title. You say, well, what do you mean? The title is in the Constitution, Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. That title can never be removed from that document. It can never be circumvented from that constitutional basis. It cannot be manipulated. That's the reason that the power of the patent folks is so critical and so strong. The other thing it's protected, I shared earlier, by treaty law. There isn't a court in this land that can nullify or supersede or annul a treaty. Are you with me? So here we are, folks. You better quit listening to the six o'clock news. There's <laughs> nothing. I call that diarrhea of the mouth. Corporate propaganda. Well, it is. It's become a propaganda machine. I got scolded by a guy one time. He said, do you watch CNN? I said, I've never watched CNN. Oh, he got madder than heck at me. Boy, he said, you're not informed. He said, you better watch that. He said, that you'll get all the right news from there. And I looked at him and I shook my head and I said, whatever floats your boat. Okay. Let's go on. I want to read you a couple things out of the Alabama uh, codes and sections about having to do with land patents. It says under section 12, 21, 96, where a certified copy of a track, a book showing the homestead entry, which is your land patent, it said, and contains lands and the final certificate issuance of the patent is admitted into evidence. It establishes prima facie evidence that the patentee has vested with the perfected title to the land, and it gives a court case, sir. Alabama Code states land patents 
issued by the United States or any state of the United States, and the track book kept on the probate offices in the county are required by law or copy or certified copies of entries taken therefrom must be received in evidence without further proof. In other words, folks, that patent stands on its own merit. It doesn't need anything else to support it. It doesn't need any other argument to, to validate its, its lawful existence or whatever. And I'm telling you, this thing just goes on and I won't get into a whole lot of it. Let me read a couple more quickly for you. It said a grant, which is a land patent, the rights in public property accepted by the beneficiary amounts to a contract entitled to protection against impairment or by any action of the state or municipalities acting under state authority. Blair versus Chicago. What did that just say? Your land patent folks has to be protected and it is protected. We just, uh, Ron just froze for a second. Oh no. Bear. You're muted, Bear. I'll give him a call. Yeah, all good. He still seems to be there, but maybe he... Uh... Nobody oh, can intervene. Grace. Uh, there, you go. there we are. We lost you there. If you want to step back a second, Ron, we lost you about maybe 30 seconds ago. Uh oh. He's having some internet problems. You know, it's interesting that uh, Ron, I didn't know this about his background, but he's got Native American blood in him. That's something to talk about too, because one of the big detractors bear with all this is okay the man oh there we go ron how you doing I'm good okay yeah you were you were frozen for the last minute so maybe some internet issues but i think you're back okay okay Keep, continue on sir <laughs> well i was just reading let, let me read another one from the alabama thing and then we'll move on no problem this is from the alabama document after public lands has been passed out of the government by the issuance of a valid patent, the courts will protect private rights thereby uh, acquired against interference, interference by collective surveys subsequently made by the land department. In other words, the issue an agency that issued this, they, they, <laughs> they can't touch any of this patent stuff. I mean, it just, it, it's so well protected, it's really mind boggling when you really start to understand how this whole thing works, man, it's beautiful. It almost makes you think that maybe the founders knew what they were doing in terms of foreseeing the tyranny that is always around the corner. Our founding fathers, well, biblical scholars in their own right, for the most part, not all of them, but most of them. And I have done extensive study about our forefathers. And I was going to bring a document and read to you about the cost of them for, for creating the Constitution and sending it around to the Commonwealth to have them sign it. They paid dearly for it, lost their home, lost their family, family members were killed, they were beaten and imprisoned, and on and on to give you the rights that we now cherish today but we better keep cherishing it and fight for it or we're gonna lose it. It's that simple. I wanna read you something here too. This comes out of United States Code, Title 43 USC, United States Code, Section 57 and 83. Listen to this carefully. Title 43 USC, Section 57, Establish that duly certified copy of the land patent 
shall be evidence in all cases where the original would be the evidence. That's a certified copy of this document that I keep showing you right here. Now this is a, is a true copy. It's embossed and it's signed on the back. You can't see it, but it's embossed right here, okay? You can take this document and there's any land issue that you're dealing in any kind of a court, code enforcement or foreclosure or whatever, the courts have to take judicial notice. Now, let me read the rest of this to you under Title 43. Title 43, Section 83 covers the evidentiary effect of the certified land patents for all states, <clears throat> excuse me, and in all courts. Excuse me, in the United States, and the courts must take judicial notice of the federal patents and their evidentiary effect under these federal statutes. All judges in all states shall be bound as to the power and the validity of the patent. One of the court cases, United States versus DeBell. <clears throat> what did that just say? What'd that say to you guys? There. What that means. Sorry, I'm... No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> if you have a dispute in any kind of a court action that involves what you're doing on your land, unless you're you're, you're jeopardizing. The only two things, let me digress a moment. <clears throat> there are only two occasions to where the code enforcement people, we, we call it the police power. Every state has what's defined as a police power. That means that they can send uh, duly represented people in to stop, curtail, or whatever. If you're doing something that's hazardous to your neighbor or to the public at large, okay? the neighbor can't go to the code enforcement and complain because he doesn't like something that you're doing. It, it has to be a direct threat to public health, safety, and welfare. If it is not that, and it has to be evident of that, not an assumption made, or it might, or maybe, or sometime, or someday, that doesn't hold water. Can they implement the police power? Other than that, the municipality, the county, the state, the federal government has no lawful authority to infringe upon your property. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, for the sake of that Title 43, it's pretty evident. Let me take you now. <clears throat> I want to share with you. It's called Corpus Juris Secundum. That means the original law, seventy-three B, and it states that once a patent is issued, neither the patent is issued by the grantor to the grantee. Neither party can change anything on that patent. Neither party can change anything on that patent. So where do the courts get any authority to say, well, no, that patent isn't valid. And I hear that from judges and attorneys all the time. Oh, that's old stuff. We don't recognize it. Well, you better recognize it because the federal statute says that you have to recognize it. When you find the words in a, in a statute that says shall or must, that's mandatory. When you see the word may, that's discretionary. There's nothing discretionary about this land patent business, folks. Okay? So just wanted to read you that. That corpus juris secundum 73B, nothing could be changed. And I might mention, if I may, that there are only two provisions in law that you can nullify, that the government can nullify a patent. 
And that has to be done by the representative agency, either the General Land Office originally or now the Bureau of Land Management. Only two occasions. Number one, there has to be evidence of fraud. And number two, an obvious clerical error are the only two reasons. There is no other. I repeat, there is no other means of nullifying that land value. And that's only good for two years. Yeah, so, so, so <clears throat> someone in the, in the, in the DLive chat here mentioned the UN trying to do land grab in the name of public health. And that's kind of going back to the zoning stuff you were talking about, Ron. But that's just to do with, um, you know, uh, so the, the, the theory is the UN's going to try to say that because of the carbon emissions of your land and uh, that it's a, it's a, it's, you know, a public health issue. Um, you know, they try to do all these fancy legalese things. But what you just said there is no matter what, um, the land patent is uh, in this country, at least the United States is uh, cannot be uh, over overcome by those kind of tactics. That is correct. You nailed it right there. And like I shared in my term was this land patent stuff uh, is embedded in stone, immovable. So uh, I love this subject on the thing because without land, what do you do? And I want to tell you a little story here real quickly. Years ago when the general land or the uh, Department of Geology and Mineral Industries had an office in Grants Pass uh, here where uh, I live. It was very interesting. They had a, a video that you rented out of there. And the title of the video was called Out of the Rock. And it was a mining promotional, uh, promotional video. Showed freeways and skyscrapers and battleships and airplanes and computers and household goods and I mean it just covered better part of an hour with it. Toward the end of that video, the narrator of that said something very profound. And he asked this question, what would our life be like without mining? Okay. So then the camera moves up to the clock on the wall and that clock disappears, moves over to the toaster the toaster disappears, then to the coffee pot, and then to the dishes on the counter, and then the countertop, and then the faucet and the sink, and the stove and the refrigerator. And it just kept going, the siding inside of the house, the paint, you know, the windows went away. And this thing just kept flashing back and forth, all these things being removed. And the last scene of that, this woman is standing in her home, with nothing there. Now, if they would have taken to the nth to its proper conclusion, she would have been standing there with no clothes on. And I don't say that to be suggestive. What <laughs> I'm saying, it takes mine products to make machines to make the textiles that we wear for clothing and coats and socks and ta da ta da ta da ta da. The point being is there's an old saying. If it isn't grown, it's mined. It is only from the production of natural resources that creates wealth. I was talking to a group of businessmen here some years ago. And one of the gentlemen there, he owned seven McDonald franchises. And I made that statement. I said, all wealth comes from the ground. And he said, no, it doesn't. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I own seven McDonald franchises. And he said, I make about eight and a half million dollars, eight, eight and a half million, whatever it was, a year on these franchises. And uh, he said, and when he started to say something else, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, where does your hamburger come from? And he looked at me like a deer in a headlight. He said, what do you mean? I said, where does your beef come from? Well, he said, it comes from my supplier. I said, where does the supplier get it? So he said, well, from, from the distribution network. I said, where do they get it? I said, sir, the point I'm trying to make it, it goes right back to that cow eating green grass that provided the beef 
for to be, make hamburgers for people like you and the consumers. I said, what about the windows in your, you got a lot of windows in your, your hamburger facility. I said, what about the block? How about your stove, your countertop, your fans, electrical wiring? And we went right down through the list. And he looked at me and kind of shrugged his shoulders. He said, I never thought about it like that. I said, well, I'm not trying to be facetious, but we need to understand where our wealth comes from. When you take a raw material and you produce something with it, that creates wealth. So anyway, all right. And I might just add that they're doing everything in their power right now to diminish wealth by, by seizing all of those resources. That is correct. We are under attack, folks. They want to ruin. Uh, I talked to some farmers called me the other day, three farmers, and they were now being told that they can't grow the food crops that they were growing. And in fact, they get federal subsidies for growing certain things, and now they're paying them not to grow it and to plow up a lot of their, their uh, fruits and vegetables, et cetera. Why do you think in California, down in the San Joaquin Valley in the west side of the San Joaquin Valley about 10 years ago, they cut off the water supply, took out over 3 million acres of prime agricultural ground that we got fruits and, and, and vegetables and nuts and all kinds of stuff. You drive down there now, it's nothing but just tumbleweed. Horrible looking the world before. It was profitable and it was productive and crops are growing, et cetera, et cetera. As a result of that, and on top of, went up. And on top of that, they're even changing the genetics that God put here in the first place. That is correct. That's absolutely correct. So we got food now that is, is not good, healthy food for you. It looks good, tastes good, but has no nutritional value. And, and, and the ironic thing is, Ron, and this goes full circle back to the Bible, this is a spiritual war. It is. And, and the forefathers understood that because this has, been, this, is, this has been the thing on this planet forever. Ever since the issue of Adam and Eve, it's been a battle, hasn't it? Yep. So I have here a document in my hand. It's a multiple pages, pages and pages of uh, court cases that, and I titled it, the tax on land patents uh, unlawful. Any attack upon your land is, um, is, is literally unlawful. And let me give you an example you're probably all very familiar with and that is a foreclosure of a property. And I want to digress to that a moment because for those of you who may not know, the banks don't loan you a red penny. All bank loans are unlawful. And I proved it. I've got testimony of other cases to where it's been proven. Well, here's what they do is that they take your promissory note and a promissory note has been allowed to be treated in different fashions. Number one is that they can use it as a check. Remember the, the, the uh, promissory note is always the same value as, as what you're buying the property. It's a half a million dollars, the promissory note is for half a million dollars. But one of the options, they can cash that as a check they go to the International Monetary Fund after on the fourth day and they cash that. They then send that to the title company that then pays off the, uh, the seller. Or the other thing they can do, they can take that and they can monetize it, securitize it, and send it to Dun & Bradstreet. They do a massive amount of this at the same time. But they... <clears throat> They monetize it and they're, they're rated uh, by Dun and Bradstreet and then they're sent to New York, to Wall Street, and then they're put into different stocks and that trade on the, on the trading platforms. So that in essence, the people who, if you were to use the term claim to, owner, uh, to own that property, 
may be in Europe and China and Russia and New Zealand, whatever, because they're all split up in these thousands and thousands and thousands of stock. So what happens was that when you default and after the third month, then they send you a notice of default with the uh, intent to, to, to quit or to do a judicial foreclosure using the courts. And they will come in and they will petition the court of which to issue a, a decree that says that you now have lost your home. Let me tell you the problem with that, folks. The bank does not have a title. I'll say it again. The bank does not have a title. All land transactions according to land law must be accompanied with a title. That's the reason that they changed the definition going back to 1946, of which they redefined land to be real estate so that they could use you know, a marketable title or a sheriff sale title or a tax sale title. None of those. Now, remember the, the illustration I gave you? The patent went here and then it went down and then continues on. Mm -hmm. If that patent is forever, then how effective is all of this smoke and mirrors above it that they're trying to cover up? Are, are you with me here? Boy, this is important to understand. That patent is forever. No matter what you pile on top, it's give an example. You go out here to the parking lot and there's a brand new Royals Roar sitting there and you put <clears throat> a Volkswagen sticker on it. Does that make that car now a, a, a Volkswagen? It's identified as a Volkswagen. So everybody said, well, it must be a Volkswagen. That Royals Royce is still there, isn't it? All you got to do is peel the pat the, the the sticker off of it, if I can use that analogy. And that's the same principle with a patent. That patent is forever, folks, forever, forever. Never let that lose your brain. That's why when you know what your rights are, you can challenge it. Now, let me tell you something that I've done numerous times for people. Here we go. We have a code enforcement guy comes around. I've been asked to do this several times. And when he comes around and he starts saying, you know, I'm going to cite, then I said, wait a minute, I've been, been commissioned to speak for him. No, well, who are you? And I say, I'm Ron Gibson. I said, I have one basic question for you. And they say, what's that? I said, show me where you're named on his patent. Remember me sharing with you a little earlier about the Summa case, what the Supreme Court said to the state of California? Where is your name on that patent? Without your name being on that patent, you have no privity, you have no authority, you have no standing, and you have no jurisdiction. Get off my property. Get a minor. Replace the footbridge. He, he, his mining camp was on one side, and the stream was only about three feet wide, but it ran all year from spring from the mountain. But his mine was across a little footbridge that somebody else had built, and it had rotted and fell down the creek. And Robbie pulled everything out and cut it up and made firewood. It got it out of the stream, cleaned it all up. Then he fell three trees and placed them in the same place where the other trees were. And then he put a boardwalk and had handrails up with rope on the side. Well, a Forest Service guy drives, they were about 100 feet off of, of the Forest Service road. And he came by one day and he stopped and he said, do you have a plan of operation to build that bridge? He said, I don't need a plan of operation. He said, oh, yes, you do. So anyway, he said, you either get a plan of operation or I'm going to make you tear it out. So anyway, he came back and came back three or four times. And finally, the guy started threatening Robbie. So Robbie called me up and he said, Ron, he said, they're coming Monday morning. Would you come and, and, and help me out here? I don't know what to say. I said, OK. So. The meeting was at nine o'clock. I showed up about 8.30. 
And I told Robbie, I said, just let me do the talking. So the forestry guy showed up and he walked up to where Robbie and I was standing. And I said, good morning, sir. I said, I stuck my hand out. I said, my name's Ron Gibson. And I've been asked by Robbie here to intervene in this little meeting. And he said, well, okay. So I said, before we get started, I said, I have a question. And he said, what's that? And I said, I'd like to see your current OMB number. And he pulled back his head and he looked at me and he said, I said that is for you folks that may not know, that's authorization from the Office of Management and Budget that authorizes him to use the vehicle to gas, oil, his labor, time, all of that to do certain functions on behalf of the government. Well, in a mining issue, the Forest Service has no jurisdiction over the mining. Are, are you with me? Mm -hmm. He's out there with no authority and he had no way to prove that he had a right to be there. So when I challenged him with the, the question for him to provide me with a valid o &B number, I mean, it just caught him so off guard, he didn't know what to say. And then pretty soon he said, well, well, no. And I knew that he can't go get one because the forest be not authorized with any jurisdiction over the mining. So anyway, just another example of, you know, just little things like that go a long way. On the and flip side, on the flip side of that, Ron, though, there are major mining operations that are international that are kind of scary that we're always trying to stop at the Smith River. And can they use that same the same thing to for their nefarious deeds to strip mine and, and potentially wreak well, havoc on their that, ecosystem? That's a very good question. But let me clarify something. First of all, they want and went and got a permit. Once you apply for any permit, driver's permit, building permit, whatever the deal is, then in essence, you are obligated yourself, excuse me, to all of the rules and regulations to that. Now, had they not agreed to get a plan of operation, then it does apply to them because mining is a granted right. The mineral is a disposed property under H.R. 365, an enactment Congress called the 1866, 1870, and 1872 mining law. That's why they knew that they had to... And the other thing about the mining law, if I may say quickly, that uh, if you look at Title 30, Section 1801 through 1811, you will find that it's tied directly to national defense. If you look at the date of the enactment of the mining law, was a year after the end of the Civil War. Both the North and the South were deficient about military hardware, pots and pans and bullets and muskets and rifles and cannons and whatever, because they did not have the inadequate supply of raw material. Congress decided right then, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to create a national mining law that they got from the miners and that we are going to tie it directly under Title 30, which the mining law is from 21A to 54. And we're going to tie it to that enactment under, under Section 8, uh, 1801 to 1811. And so that's why we have the communications, our internet, and all of this stuff today, jet aircraft and all of the, the military hardware that we do to try to protect this nation from foreign aggression, which is a pretty good deal, I think. I've been in war. I know what, what, what communism can do. So anyway, enough of that. Yeah. Um, next item. How are we doing on time? Are we in a problem here? Or? Oh, we're good. Okay. It was whatever you're being very generous uh, ron so whatever you have uh, we're all ears and and um you know we just appreciate you going into such depth and you know there are a lot of uh questions and things but i think you're answering a lot of them as we go here well i'm certainly willing to give uh i'd like to conclude at 12 o'clock my time if we can but let's do the last 15 minutes of question and answer 
Neil, but before we go right. there, uh, I want to go to the trespass section of my book. Let me turn to it here quickly. Here we go. On page 143. I want to read this to you, and I'm asking you to listen very carefully because, boy, this, this is exactly true, correct, and lawful. Okay? Michigan jurisprudence. Now, this applies to many other states and most all states, but the one I pulled out just because of the way that it was worded, I really like this, and I put it in my book, okay? Michigan jurisprudence has never recognized immunity on behalf of a city, village, township, county, or any administrative division, therefore, from liability for trespass on private property. Whether the trespass be long or of short duration, and it's got the court case here. The Fourth Amendment authorizes a person in plaintiff's position as proprietor of a business uh, other than one previously regulated since the trafficking of alcohol and firearms and weapons, and it gives a court case there, to bar government agencies, including inspectors, carrying out police power functions to protect public health and safety from the property, gives the court cases. Common law and constitutional pr principles of government or sovereign immunity have never permitted government agencies to commit trespass in violation of private property rights. Okay? That's why your private property, folks, is called private. There's a reason for that. It belongs to you and to you only. And these government individuals now are so-called government uh, acting as government agents want to come and grab you around the throat and start squeezing. And I'm a sovereign. I'm a sovereign by creation of Almighty God. I'm a sovereign because I'm an American. And I get real upset with these government people and, and police officers. Oh, you're one of those sovereigns. Well, what happened with that that put a, a black mark on the name sovereign was a bunch of people got together, claimed they were sovereign, which they were, and went out and started diarrhea of their mouth without knowing the law, and then they got in trouble because they were quoting laws and trying to enact things that they that were not so. They did it wrong, and and so you know they got smeared with with a whole bunch of horse manure, so to speak. But you and I are sovereigns, and if you don't believe me. Go to the internet and look up cases under sovereignty, sovereignty cases. The Supreme Court has ruled over and over and over and over and over that sovereignty resides in the people. Now, yep. I want to share something with you real quickly. Now, this is my own view, okay? But this incident uh, last January 6th, when certain individuals stormed the Capitol building, there was an influx of people who mingled with those who were legitimately trying to set the record straight for our legislative body. But the point being, setting those ill perpetrators aside for the sake of my point, when I, I, I drew an analogy for some people in my law office here the other day, and at the top, just bear with me a minute, I put God and a little line down from that, and I put we the people, which presents all of humanity, underneath that the line, and then governments, whatever government. And under, underneath that was the courts. Underneath that was others. And I explained to these people the whole sequence of authority and jurisdiction relative to God and what authority God gave man in Genesis that he gave us authority over the entire earth. Man created government. Government didn't create itself, okay? And then through that process, the government then instituted the creation of the courts and other agencies to function the full uh, function of what uh, government should do. The vice president of the United States at that time could have stopped this whole mess. The courts failed. 
Pence failed, and on and on. When it was so overwhelmingly evident that Trump had won the election, 74 million votes, folks, unheard of. I'm not trying to promote Republican over Democrat here. That's not the point. The point here is the fact that you and I are not subject to laws because we are sovereign. We're the creator of the law. Are you with me? And boy, you better let that sink in because if you don't, you're going to be a slave forever. But the very fact that that uh, we should have had, and I'm going to use the concept, not that they could get there, but every American should have rushed the Capitol building, building and cleaned that place out as the Constitution makes provision for. If it's corrupt, get rid of it and start anew. And we sat on our butt and we let the news media determine there that, boy, all oh, those guys, they're all, every American under Article One has a right to protest. It's when we start doing damage that it becomes a, a, a crime. And we don't even know the difference anymore. The news media blends that all together. If you protest, then you're automatically a criminal. That's absolute bull crap from hell. And boy, I get emotional over that issue. I know what it is to see my comrades die on the battlefield. The last year in the Marine Corps, I took dead bodies home to their families. Freedom to it comes at great price, folks. And it even affects the incident last January 6th. What are we doing? I hear people complaining, but they don't want to do anything. Oh, not me. Amen. No, I, I can't get involved. I'm going to tell you something, folks. You better get involved up to your eyeball or you're going to lose it. And there are massive yeah. people around this nation that are working diligently through different constitutional groups and patriot groups to try to pull this thing together and salvage it. But I'm telling you, it's, yeah. a, fight. it's a dog fight from hell because that's who we're fighting is hell. Okay. I'll yeah, start. Ron. No, Ron, thanks so much for making that point uh, just right after my own heart. And, uh, you know, some of us have been working uh, in circles. I've been since the 70s and I've seen some of my colleagues, um, you know, incarcerated, even assassinated. And even in the medical field, some of us have, uh, you know, uh, uh, been severely uh, harmed and, and some even suicided. So, you know, it, it, it's a war on many levels. And, you know, the, the naysayers out there um, really have no idea. I mean, you know, uh, just, just the military, uh, you know, casualties alone. But then even in the private sector, a lot of us that have, you know, paid the price and some the price. Um, so thanks so much. And, uh, you know, one question I have, uh, this seems to be a little bit of a debate in the land patent process, is some contend that you would uh, not be able to bring yourself forward as an assignee on the land patent if you are a statutory U.S. citizen versus somebody who has did a formal um, status correction. Um, how, what would you say about that? The Supreme Court settled that question. And they said, as long as you can prove that you are an owner of record, you can bring the land patent forward. Now, lawfully, uh, other than that Supreme Court uh, ruling on the thing, in past history, uh, it was only sovereigns that could own land. And if you go back in our history of our nation, it was only land owners who could vote they were called electors, not voters. That's another thing that they changed in their changing of lawful definition, et cetera. But as long as you can prove that you have an ownership interest in that land by virtue of your warranty deed that's stamped by the county, you qualify to bring that forward. Now, having said that, another thing that I want to mention about a warranty deed, this I don't mean to digress because there are times of marching on. But the, the patent versus the warranty deed, a warranty deed conveys absolutely no ownership in land. And I get people arguing with me all the time. I own my land. I paid it off. See here, I got my warranty deed and the 
bank has signed off on it. Let me tell you what a warranty deed is. It's a color of title. It is not a true title like the land patent is. And a land patent conveys two things, or excuse me, a warranty deed, I'm sorry, two things. It acknowledges the fact that you have an equity interest in a given piece of property, and also that you have a right of possession, but absolutely no right of ownership, okay? So that's the reason that you have to convert that back to your true title of ownership, other because no government entity, there, there's nothing the courts can do to come and take that land away from you. Hey, uh, hey Ron, um, in that Ron, case, I, ha I have a friend uh, who is a German national, but has land in New Mexico and wants to do a land patent. So, would, so what you're saying is they could still prove that go through that process and they don't have to be a US citizen? That is correct. Fantastic. That's correct. That Supreme Court case and that's never been overturned. So unless it's overturned, it stands as red. So, but uh, and yes, I, I, I have another question from a friend in Hawaii who wants to secure a land patent. Uh, have you ever done one in Hawaii since Hawaii is a unique situation? I'm headed to Hawaii on the 11th and 12th of September to do a land patent seminar. So uh, to answer your question, uh, yes. And, and Ron, are you familiar, because we do have an international crowd here, uh, does this also hold up in Commonwealth countries and other places across the, uh, the world? Well, not all over the world, but it does. There are patents that are issued in Australia and New Zealand. There are patents that are issued in Canada. They're called crown patents and uh, also in Britain and different parts of Europe, but not all uh, countries of the world have land patents. And that's a unique thing about the United States. Our patents are allodial. Now, let me give you the definition of allodial. Here it is, listen carefully. Owing to no one, nor to any Lord, nor superior. Now, boy, that says it all. Hey, Ron, this is a good, actually a good segue into this question in, in regards to allodial. Um, one of our... Uh, Co-op members uh, is in another group with uh, some common law, uh, quote unquote, experts, and they were saying, you don't need a land patent. You can only own property in the USA, alloidial. The people pushing land patents are just wrong. Um, and then he asked, wait, so, okay, how can I learn more about alloidial titles? Well, there's nothing to learn. Alloidal means absolute. When you read property rights in American jurisprudence, it's quite clear on what property rights are. Uh, sounds like you are inquiring about property taxes. You need to down, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then he says, um, basically, that it's all BS, the land patent stuff. And also going through the route, it's expensive. It starts at $1,500 and goes to $5,000. Uh, so what's your statement on that um, in terms of the alloidial issue there? Well, I read to you out of my book on page five of the alloidial designation came discretion about the structure and the wording about the patent issue and by what type of land patent. And I get people all the time telling me, some guy from Snoops or whatever the hell he's from, trying to tell me all this land patent stuff is BS. How come it survived over 180 years of Supreme Court scrutiny? It's never lost at the Supreme Court level. And my, my point to those people who are the skeptics and the, and the critics, uh, go do your own research. Uh, I try to help. There's a scripture in my Bible says it all. For one to learn, one must be willing to be taught. And a lot of people don't want to be taught because they don't want to learn. So, you know, each one is entitled to their own opinion. I don't have a problem with that. But when you start trying to degrade uh, issues of fact, 
that's why I read you the forever thing about where our forefathers got the word forever in the land patent is for the purpose of establishing a title that could not be destroyed. And so that that title is an allodial title. So, you know, I don't know what else to say. Um, go ahead, Mike, did you have another question? Um, well, they're just saying, um... If you think a land patent is going to get your property off the tax rolls, you have no clue what is going on or what taxation is. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there's some more here. But I mean, I, I think you've made it pretty clear in this demonstration of what taxation is, or at least how a land patent um, gets you off the, uh, the need to pay land taxes. I um, Did we lose, Ron? Seems like Ron's so, in there. Okay, so Mike, just a quick comment. You know, I read those comments from that gentleman, uh, you know, the skeptic, and it was so flawed on so many levels, I didn't even know where to start. And it really showed a fundamental lack on so many levels of, of uh, information and knowledge and awareness. So, um, but it, it's just nice to present these questions to Ron because he has such a depth of knowledge. And the other thing I would really say is that uh, two hours here with Ron is really not able to do it justice. And my introduction to Ron is I watched a five-part series that's available on the internet in several places, uh, you know, that is, uh, I think, two, three hours each. And, uh, you know, people should really go there. Um, and, and, and again, if you really wrap your mind around the land patent, as we said last week, uh, it's really the, the foundation for everything else that this country is about and all other processes that are now being rediscovered in different circles, uh, you know, from Patriot to just people that are realizing that, you know, they need some measure of protection uh, as we find ourselves with a rogue uh, and very violent government. Yeah, the, someone was saying here, a fee simple title, the most common is an allodial form of title to property um, in that chain of, uh, of talks. Mm -hmm. And obviously this is over my head, but if that was true, then um, I mean, for me at this point, because we are, it's very obvious that we are uh, in crisis mode in terms of um, what's going on. And I'd rather not mess around with uh, theoretical concepts of common law. And I'd rather just go get my land patent. Just because of what Ron was saying, where that in the 200 years, it's never, <clears throat> um, it's, with, with, it's withheld the test of time. So why not? <laughs> like why I, and it doesn't cost 1500 to $5,000. We made that very clear in the first land patent alpha cast. It's just doing paperwork yourself. It's just more time, I guess, than than yeah. where I don't know. I'm spending a little bit. I'm spending a little bit more money on mine simply because I'm hiring a licensed uh, surveyor to come out to bolster the information packet that I'm turning over to the BLM, along with, you know, my certified warranty deeds and so forth. And, you know, that's probably going to cost me about three hundred dollars. And, uh, you know, maybe the whole thing by the time I'm through might cost me $400, probably not even. So I don't know, again, where that particular gentleman got the information and it cost $1,500 to $5,000. And I'm sure there's, uh, you know, somebody peddling paperwork out there that's charging that much and that's where he's getting it. But that's simply not the case. And I would caution anybody that's going into any kind of process, including a land patent, do your own research, make an informed decision, but also do the process yourself because that is the only way you can learn, not just getting cookie cutter um, you know, type of paperwork and filling in the blanks and letting somebody else does it. Because if there's ever uh, a situation where you have to defend it, then you're going to fall flat on your face. If you've done it yourself, done your own homework, uh, you're going to have the inner conviction that first of all, is going to put like a uh, you know, a shield of light around you that is going to make you pretty much invisible to the creature class. 
And also, if you ever did have to stand up for yourself, you're not, not going to have any problem. And most uh, important is you're not going to have any fear because you know the truth. And the only way they can beat you is by preying on your fear. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'd love to have Ron back uh, to discuss this because people in the chat are coming in and mentioning uh, this individual who's uh, proven how not to pay land or homeowner taxes without a patent. I, so um, yeah, I'd love to see that uh, more information on that. And it's the same individual who's saying that land patents aren't needed. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, Bear, I don't know. I'm not a specialist in this. Well, I'm a student myself. And, uh, you know, next week, um, I'll be with Beth, Beth Martins. Uh, it, it'll be a great show. Uh, it's not going to be solely about land patents, but we are going to talk more with a broader stroke about all the processes that uh, her and Matt Belair have brilliantly, um, you know, presented in, uh, you know, their panel on all the legal processes that, you know, that would, you know, help people these days. Uh, some of those people I'm actually working with presently for other legal restructuring, just to bring everything up to, to snuff. And then also the land patent will be very prominent. Uh, hang on, that might be it's wrong. probably wrong. I do find it. it okay. I'm going to mute myself. I do find it interesting that um, the, the same person here who is um, questioning the efficacy of the connection of the Bible with the legal system, which goes back to ecclesiastic law, which uh, super, you know, is what has been used as the foundation for common law, which is the rules that we are, are having to play by. Also, is calling Ron a statist or asking if he's a statist, which is interesting considering that the entire constitution and the framework that the founders developed was to counter statism, was to counter at least from my understanding of what the definition of statism is, which is the, the rights of, which is the true liberal philosophy of individual rights. And that's why I, I find it baffling that this person is calling Ron a status when he's literally talking about individual land uh, property rights, uh, which is the foundation for our ability to maintain our freedoms. So um, it's the very antithesis of statism for, as from what I understand. So anyways, that is a, a fascinating uh, step to take in your, um, <clears throat> in your logic there. Uh, and like I was mentioning before, and shout out to Marty Leeds who came on DLive and, and threw us some, some crypto there. Um, Marty has done a wonderful job at laying out what the Bible actually is. And um, it is all esoteric. And the founding fathers were actually very much aware of the esoteric nature of the truth of this realm that we're in and why land is so important because it's in what the earth is related to our true being, our true spiritual essence of who we are as divine, as aspects of the divine creator. So, yes, I know there's a lot of um, ridiculous stuff in the Bible, but when you break it down and understand that there's multiple layers of the Bible, there's five different layers, I believe, of the Bible, as Marty explains. And when you get into the esoteric side, that's where you start to really see the magic and see um, that this is much more than, than what, uh, uh, what many actually see it as. So, um, Bear, was that Ron? That was Ron. He's uh, having te technical difficulties and then, you know, uh, we knew ahead of time that he already had to leave at 12 anyway, which is what time it is. So uh, he just wanted to, um, uh, you know, explain that to our audience. And I thanked him profusely for being with us. And he agreed to maybe do a part three uh, with him where we go actually into the process itself and answer even more questions. Um, we had a few trolls in the chat today and, you know, usually I don't even look at the chat and I hope uh, my answering the, the trolls there for a little while didn't uh, take away from my attention, but I was with you all the time there, Mike, uh, since I've been with this before with Ron and, you know, this kind of subject matter, because it is so germane to our freedom, you know, it's going to bring uh, out technical difficulties. It's going to bring out trolls and, 
And, you know, my experience for a few years with the land patent process, it seems to bring out more detractors than any other process I know of. And I've been around the block for many years, as you know, been involved with a lot of things. But, man, land patents trigger people more than anything. Interesting. For good reason. Yeah. And Candace, I'm very familiar with the individual you're talking about. (laughs) <laughs> okay. He was also with Matt Belair and yeah, interesting, interesting stuff. Um, it seems in my own perspective that he delves more into the legal corporate system and the common law and not as, as much into um, the com- commercial side of the, doing the commerce, which really is what the land patent is talking about in terms of using the land patent bear um, against people trying to um, uh, do foreclosures and things like that. Um so anyways, yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. I love that this is such a massive hot topic in the truth community now. It's more important than ever. Um, but uh, one thing I was going to say too, Barry, people are triggered, as you were saying, by the land patent stuff because they feel like uh, one of the big detracting um, uh, statements is, of course, who's, who has any right to own land, to have a patent on land when it's all mother nature. And, um, and I find, you know, and, oh, it's the white man taking over the land, but it is interesting that um, Ron is Native, has Native American blood in, in him. So next time he's on, I'd love to get his perspective on that and more into the philosophy mm-hmm. and the theoretical ideas here uh, of all that. Yeah, um, that would be interesting. And, you know, if our audience, anybody was in part one with just you and I, Mike, last week, we actually started the episode by addressing that, uh, I stated that my belief system really isn't about, uh, you know, I own the land. We talked about stewardship versus owning. And there were times in different cultures where people didn't try to prove ownership uh, with pieces of paper. They did defend their right to be on a little piece of land that they were on, uh, you know, and defended it very stridently as we should as well. Um, We have come so far from natural law and into the la-la land of paper that, um, you know, the land patent, from my perspective, is a convenient two-step back to that, you know, um, status into pure natural law. So if we have these, uh, the creature class that is, you know, gone rogue and trying to attack us on every level and trying to um, prevent us from just thriving on the land, which is necessary for our sustenance. And they have created this whole farcical system in the first place. Well, now we use their own system, you know, that was based on those land grants in the first place. And that's all we're doing with all of these legal processes in the first place as well. You know, I've, I've talked, uh, you know, at great length on some of our past episodes I've done so much paperwork, did so many processes, went down every rabbit hole that I'm in a place in my life where I just say, screw it. I don't feel like I have to justify myself to anybody or, you know, uh, submit any more paperwork. I am who I am. Each of us can make that statement and mean it and just stand on that without any paperwork. But, um, you know, what we're doing is playing a game where we're using their own paperwork against them because they keep moving the goalposts and changing their paperwork, uh, you know, um, uh, reneging on their own contracts and so forth, just like they did with the Native Americans. Okay, well, you can be on this piece of land and, oh, no, oops, now you have to move to another piece of land. They're doing the same thing to us. And as uh, Russell Means, uh, you know, the... Uh, Native American spokesman famously said one time, we're all on the reservation now. And that's uh, the position we find ourselves in. And just like the useful idiots that are working for IRS and the bureaucrats in government and and all the the massive uh, amounts of brainwashed people out there that try to defend the exact system that's enslaving them, Um, You know, uh, certain races of people, for instance, in the settlement of this country, bought the same narratives uh, of, you know, certain people being bad, they're going to try to do this and that. And, you know, by demonizing, uh, help that population do their wet work. And, uh, you know, by buying the narrative that they had some rationale or moral 
uh, superiority or high ground in order to justify persecuting or even killing other people. So they're playing the same divide and conquer now the you know, the, the so-called white race was, you know, the useful idiots back then. Now we've got just like in the beginning of the Revolutionary War, you had the loyalist, you know, versus the patriots. It's the same blueprint, the same game plan over and over and over again. Bring it back to the land patent process. All we're saying is, OK, this is your game. You made it up. Here's here's the deal. We're holding your feet to the fire of the original process. And uh, it is my intention that more people that do this will then move into pure natural law and fulfill the real destiny of not just this nation, the three Americas and the entire world, uh, you know, to have the third and final golden age where we will live and prosper together with no needs for artificial lines on a map or pieces of paper to prove ownership or otherwise. So it's uh, it's a convoluted system we find ourselves in, and you have to be uh, a little bit knowledgeable of the game that they're playing. That's what this whole talk is about in the first place. Beautiful. And I, I'll just add that we are in triage moment right now, just trying to um, keep our head over, above water. So why not use tools that we know have been proven um, practically to uh, get us to that point where we have built enough of the new in our own community and our own places, then we can go to that next level. And, and, but right now we're in massive triage because the world's burning all around us and um, wild times. So, Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Bear Lando. Appreciate that. And um, these are all really important conversations to have. And that's what we're all about is, is maintaining the open conversation, um, not shouting other people down, not, uh, not saying we know all, because I'll be the first to say I don't know all. And I'm sure you too, Bear. So <laughs> we're here to learn. So, um, Okay, guys. Well, we appreciate it. And uh, this uh, is probably one you're going to want to listen to a few times. So uh, catch the, the AlphaCast recording on, it'll be on, of course, as always, Podbean, iTunes, all those as an audio recording, or you can catch the replay on YouTube. And of course, Odyssey uh, is the place to catch it. We're trying to get more people to go over to Odyssey because I'm amazed we're still even on YouTube. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, we appreciate you, uh, get outside, go get your hands in the dirt, grow, grow food. I think that's becoming very obvious. Um, what we're seeing in France right now, what we're seeing in other parts of the world, food is going to be very, very important. Uh, the Justin Tyne system is failing right now. So, uh, get sovereign, uh, get uh, control of uh, your land and stay healthy. We love you and we'll see you next week. Cheers.